the arrival of Islam in the Malay world has been a subject of scholarly interest, attracting the attention of both modern historians and authors of classical Malay historical texts. The different perspectives taken by these scholars have resulted in contrasting explanation of this pivotal event. While, while modern historians and post-colonial scholars lean towards factual analysis, the authors of classical Malay texts employ symbolism and legendary stories to describe the spread of Islam in the region. The two divergent approaches rooted in Orientalist studies and indigenous narratives, respectively, have shed light on the question of when, where, and how Islam reached the Malay world. In the modern historical approach, Orientalist scholars have dedicated their research to pinpointing the chronological and geographical aspects of Islam's arrival. Many of them support the notion that Islam took root in the Malay world as early as the 13th century, with Indian ports being recognized as significant ports of call through which Islam was introduced. According to this perspective, traders traversing the Indian coastal regions played a casual role in disseminating Islamic beliefs across the Malay archipelago. Conversely, the classical Malay historical texts take a more mystical and metaphorical route, focusing on where and how Islam was embraced by the Malay kings and their subjects. The authors of these texts use symbolism and legendary narratives to elucidate the process of Islam's acceptance. Dreams and enigmatic journeys are recurrent motifs used to explain how the Malay rulers converted to Islam, followed later by the masses. For instance, the texts of Hikayat Raja Pasai and Sejarah Melayu recount dream experiences that serve as a medium for king's conversions, while Hikayat Merum Hawangsa narrates the mysterious journey of a Muslim scholar accompanied by the chief of demons to the king's court. This paper aims uh, to bridge the gap between these two distinct approaches and determine which one provides a more comprehensive and meaningful understanding of the historical event for Malay Muslims. By critically analyzing the strengths and limitations of both perspectives, we seek to shed light on the complex and intriguing process through which Islam found its place in the heart and minds of the Malay people. Ultimately, these research endeavors to offer a nuanced and holistic understanding of the advent of Islam in the Malay world and its profound impact on the region's cultural, social and religious landscape. Historical Facts of the Coming of Islam to the Malay World When was Islam came to the Malay world? Many modern historians believe that Islam came to the Malay world around the 13th century. The exact timeline, however, however, is subjected to some debate among historians. But it is generally believed that Islam was introduced to the region through interactions with Arab and Indian traders and scholars. The spread of Islam in the Malay archipelago, which includes present-day Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, and parts of Thailand, Singapore, and the Philippines, was gradual and occurred over several centuries. How and who introduced Islam to the Malay world? The process of Islamization in the Malay world involved a combination of trade with networks, diplomatic relations and the influence of Sufi mystics and scholars. Merchants and traders from the Islamic world played a significant role in fostering connections and facilitating the exchange of goods and ideas between the Middle East and the Malay archipelago. As a result, Islam gradually took root in various coastal trading centers and port cities. The spread of Islam was further supported by the influence of Sufi missionaries who traveled to the region to spread Islamic teachings. These Sufi mystics 
emphasize a more spiritual and accessible interpretation of Islam, which resonated with the local populations. Over time, the Malay rulers and aristocracy also embraced Islam, leading to its gradual adoption among the wider population. The conversion to Islam in the Malay world was not always uniform and some regions embraced Islam earlier than others. The process was also influenced by local, cultural, political and social factors resulting in the syncretic blend of Islamic practices with existing indigenous beliefs and customs. Today, Islam is the dominant religion in most parts of the Malay world and the region has a rich Islamic heritage and that has significantly influenced its culture, architecture, arts and way of life. From where Islam comes to the Malay world? There are various theories concerning the coming of Islam to the Malay archipelagos. Many Orientalists who studied the advent of Islam to the Malay world tend to conclude that Islam was brought from India. According to Dreves, the person who first introduces the Indian origin theory in the Dutch is the Dutch scholars. According to Dreves, the, the person who first introduces the Indian origin theory is the Dutch scholar Pij Nepal, the first professor of Malay studies at the University of Leiden. He argued that Islam was brought by the Arabs who belonged to the Shafi'i Mazhab and they came from Gujarat and Malabar in India. Pijnapal's theory was later on supported by another Dutch scholar, Snokha Gronje. He argued because Islam already controlled the port cities in southern India and the trade occurs between the Malay world and the southern part of India. This is most probably the reason that contributes to the Islamization of the Malay world. The Sayyids of Arab traders who live in southern India and did business with other parts of the world played an important role in spreading the teaching of Islam. J.P. Moke, who discovered the gravestones of the Maulana Malik Ibrahim in Pasai, Sumatra, dated 1424, common era, which is similar to the gravestone in Kambay, Gujarat, India, had in addition presented another proof of the Islamization of the Malay world through India. He argued that because the gravestones were produced in India and exported to the Malay archipelagos, as such, Islam was also exported to the Malay world from India. This theory was supported by R.O. Winstead, who discovered the same pattern of the gravestones in Bruas, Perak. T.W. Arnold, however, sees the similar pattern of the religious practices of the people in Malabar and Coromandel in India and to the people in the Malay world as another strong argument for the theory of Islamization of the Malay world through the Indian continent. Brian Harrison, in addition, brought another different argument to strengthen the theory. According to him, India in the past is the land that inspired the Malay world with Hinduism and Buddhism. Therefore, it had done similar things later, later on to the Malay world by inspiring Islam to it. <coughs> the theory of Islamization of the Malay world from India is largely held by Orientalists, especially those who specialize in the history of the Islamization of the Malay world. The only different aspect of the views among them is in the question regarding which part of India Islam came from. Some rejected Gujarat as the place and preferred Bengal because during those times, Bengal is the only place taken control by Muslims, while the other parts of India are still under the domination of Hindus. This view, which is held by G. E. Morris Marison, is supported by the notes mentioned that the title used by the Pasai king Thakur is the title used in Bengal. Now we have seen that many reasons were forwarded by this group of scholars to maintain their view that Islam came to the Malay world from or through India. Their arguments, among other things, are based on the similarities in external teachings and practice, political and trade issues, and also archaeological and as well as historical facts. Yet there is another group of scholars who do not agree with this previous view and in contrast, they had introduced other theories and views. K. 
Cases, for instance, said that Islam came directly from Egypt because in the early period of Islamization, Egypt had a very good relationship with the Malay world, especially concerning trade. Besides, the sect or mazhab, which is practiced by the Muslim in the Malay world and the one practiced by the Muslim in Egypt, is similar, i.e. mazhab al-Shafi'i, while the sect practiced in India is mazhab Hanafi. In addition, to prove that Islam came directly from Egypt, the name of the earliest king of Pasai who embraced Islam is Malik al-Sadeh, and his children are Malik al-Zahir and Malik, al- Malik al-Mansur. Those three names are derived from the names of kings of Egypt. Malik al-Saleh, who reigned between 1240 to 1249 and was responsible in 1244 for the restoration of Islam to the much coveted city of Jerusalem and the imprisonment of the leader of the Sixth Crusade, King Louis <coughs> the Ninth of France. Another one is Malik al-Zahir, who reigned from 1260 to 1277 and was the hero of the Battle of Ain Jalut in 1260. His successor, Malik al Mansur, who reigned from 1279 to 1290, continues his campaign. Several other Western scholars also supported this theory of the origin of Islam from Egypt, including Neiman and the Hollander. John Crawford proposed that missions from Arab lands are playing an important role in the Islamization of the Malay world since they had already possessed a strong sea fleets that sailed to the far east and can easily reach the Malay archipelagos. al attas comments on the historical theories. Said Muhammad Naqib al attas a well-known Malay scholar, critically questioned the accuracy of various theories concerning the arrival and the dissemination of Islam in the Malay world. He found these theories inadequate as they were based on speculative assumptions and exhibited a clear bias against the Islamic religion, culture, and Arab influences. According to al attas Islam's advent in the Malay world can be attributed to Arab or Arab Persian missionaries who played a significant role in propagating the faith as evidenced by major writings on Islam in the region. These missionaries arrived either from Arab territories or through India and China. He said, roughly from the 10th or 17th century backwards, all the major relevant or religious literary evidence studied did not record a single Indian author or work of Indian origin. Any author described as Indian or work as of Indian origin by Western scholars turned out to be actually Arab or Persian, and most of what has been described as Persian has in fact been Arabian, whether considered ethnically or culturally. The early missionaries do from what is known of their names and titles, have been Arab or Arab Persians. It is true that some came via India, but some also came direct from Arabia or via Persia and from there via China. It is, it is true that some works were written in India, but their origins is Arabia and Persia, or they could even be in comparatively small measure. Turkey or the Arab or the Maghrib and what is more important, their religious content is Middle Eastern, not India, not Indian. al Atas specifically emphasized that the 12th to 16th century witnessed the pro- proliferation of Islam in the Malay world, with Arabs from the lineage of Bani Alawi of Hadramaut, descendant of Hussein, the grandchild of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, being instrumental in this spread. Al Atas asserted that the missionary's Arab identity was primarily established through genealogy rather than ethnic tribes. This view found support in one Muhammad Sagir reference to the book Shamsul Al Zahira by a Said Sharif Abdul Rahman bin Muhammad bin Hussein Al Mashur. The Bani Alawi preachers played a crucial role in spreading Islam across various regions, including Sumatra. Java, Sulu, Makassar, Mindanao, Brunei, and the Malay Peninsula. They successfully preached to local rulers and established Islamic Malay government, particularly during the 12th to 16th centuries. 
Al Atas provided a historical framework outlining different phases of Islam's progression in the Malay world. The first phase between 579 to 805 Hijrah or 1200 to 1400 uh, AD. The second phase is between 803 to 1112 Hijrah or between 1400 to 1700 AD. And the third phase between 1112 Hijrah and uh, 1700 AD onwards were characterized by unique developments and key features in the spread of Islam. Al Atas affirms that the well known theory that Islam came from India and was conveyed to the archipelago by Indians cannot be accepted. Those who hold the theory are overlook the internal part of Islam and ignore the meaning of Islam itself. And what they are looking for is the external part of Islam, including the trade patterns and past experiences with Hinduism and Buddhism. The tombstones and gravestones theory cannot be considered as proof of the process of Islamization of the Malay world from India, since it is well known that the trade relationship between these two sides is already established long ago before Islam came. And because India is closer to the Malay world, many things and products are imported directly from India, and Islam is not one of them. Symbolism and Legendary Stories on the Coming of Islam to the Malay World On the other hand, the classical Malay historical texts adopt a more mystical and allegorical approach centering on the where and how of Islam's adoption by the Malay rulers and their subjects. These literary works <coughs> employ symbolism and legendary tales to shed light on the process of embracing Islam. Recurring motifs such as dreams and enigmatic journeys are employed to portray how the Malay rulers first embrace Islam, followed subsequently by the common people. The Islamization of the King and the Kingdom in Hikayat Raja Pasai The story of the Islamization of the King and the Kingdom was also among the major feature of Hikayat Raja Pasai. On the occasion of the Islamization of the King, the text mentioned, Merah Silau had a dream and in his dream he saw a person standing, his chin cupped in his hand, his eyes covered by his four fingers. The person said, Mirah Silau, recite the words of the profession of faith. I do not know how to recite them, replied Mirah Silau. Open your mouth, said the person. Mirah Silau opened his mouth and the person spat into it. The taste was rich and sweet. Then he said to Mirah Silau, Your name shall be Sultan Maliko Sadeh. From now on, you are Muslim and will recite the words of the profession of faith. It is a miraculous story mixed with factual events. There might be no strong evidence to prove Merah Silao's dream. However, based on a study conducted by J.P. Moke, who published several photographs of the inscription of the tombs of Malikus Saleh, died 1297, he is a Muslim. The date itself tells us the story of early Islamization since as far as the historical, historical facts and shreds of evidence were concerned, there is no other part of Sumatra that received Islam before Samudra Pasai. On the other hand, the Islamization of the people of the kingdom is different from that of the king. It was realized under the hands of Sheikh Ismail, a Muslim scholar who was ordered by the Muslim Caliph to sail to Samudra. The story goes that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said in Mecca that one day there will be a land named Samudra and he ordered his companions and followers to prepare the ship and kingdom's emblems, the regalia and panoply of royalty and voyage there to spread Islam whenever they heard about this name. The Prophet also reminded them of a fakir from Mangiri that they have to bring together to the Samudra. 
When the news of Samudra reached Mecca, the Muslim Caliph ordered Sheikh Ismail to fulfill the saying of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He reached Samudra, and despite knowing that the king was already a Muslim, he asked him once again to recite the profession of faith. This event symbolizes the formal and ceremonial conversion of the king into Islam in front of his people. The story the story goes further. Then Sheikh Ismail ordered an assembly of the chiefs and the people, great and small, old and young, male and female. When they were all gathered together, they were taught by Sheikh Ismail to recite the profession of faith. The whole population willingly recited the words of the profession of faith, in all sincerity and with a true belief in their hearts. Therefore, the city of Samudra was given the name of Darussalam. For among the people, all strife and conflict ceased, and they did not weary of their zeal in spreading the faith of Islam. It is very interesting to know how the Islamization of Samudra took place. The text here is using an Islamic method to prove a historic event of Islamization, that is by using a narration from hadith or the prophetic tradition, the second major source of Islam. However, as far as the study of hadith in Islamic tradition goes, there is no such story narrated in any authentic books of hadith that the Prophet has said such words and narrated such an event. Nevertheless, it is not primarily our concern here to judge the text through the method of hadith criticism in this paper. Our primary concern here is, firstly, the story of the Islamization of the king and kingdom at large is contained in Hikayat Raja Pasai. Secondly, the conversion of the king in comparison to his people usually occurred differently. In Hikayat Raja Pasai, it occurred through a dream experience, while his people were ordinarily converted to Islam, a face-to-face -face meeting. The Islamization of the King and the Kingdom in Sejarah Melayu Quite similar to the story of the Islamization of Pasai in Hikayat Raja Pasai, the Islamization of the Malaccan King and his Kingdom was also illustrated in a mythical approach. <coughs> the text mentioned, the King there is Raja Tengah, had a dream of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who taught him the words of the profession of faith and became a Muslim. When he woke up in the morning, he was already been circumcised, a sign of his true dream and conversion to Islam. While his people were later on com been converted to Islam by Sayyid Abdul Aziz. Apart from telling the story of the Islamization of Malacca, Sejarah Melayu was also telling the story of how Pasai and other places accepted Islam. Concerning the Islamization of Pasai, Sejarah Melayu has made some distinct points from what was told in Hikayat Raja Pasai. While Hikayat Raja Pasai told a story of that Pasai is the first kingdom to accept Islam, Sejarah Melayu maintained that there were already several places that accepted Islam before Pasai such as Pansuri, Lamiri, Haru and Perlak. While Hikayat Raja Pasai maintained that Merah Silau converted to Islam through his dream experience of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Sejarah Melayu maintained that the dream happened after Merah Silau was already converted to Islam at the hand of the fakir, and dream only plays a medium in which he was then taught by the Prophet to read the Quran. According to Ali Haji Ahmad. This distinction is due to the cultural political setting in which Sejarah Melayu was authored. The author of Sejarah Melayu intended to show that Melaka is the greatest kingdom in every single aspect of the historical event. The Islamization of the King and the Kingdom in Hikayat Merung Mahawangsa The author of Hikayat Merung Mahawangsa has chosen an unusual way to describe the Islamization of Kedah as compared to other classical Malay historical texts. Both Hikai Raja Pasai and Sejarah Melayu have used dream experiences as a medium for the Islamization of a king. In Hikai Merong Mahawangsa, however, the author used the story of the curiosity of Sheikh Abdullah to know how the demon has projected his works to deviate the people. The story goes, one day, Sheikh Abdullah went to see his teacher, Sheikh Abdullah the Senior. He said, 
your servant ask you to arrange me to meet with the chief of Satan to learn and see how they had deviated all the men and creations with your permission please let me have it his wish then was fulfilled invisible together with the chief of demons they journeyed through from Yaman to Kedah during the journey the chief of the demons has shown him how he and his followers carried out their dirty jobs persuading people to to do evil things their journey ended at the bedroom of raja praong mahawangsa in kedah when sheikh abdullah expressed his dissatisfaction over the behavior of the demon chief who was urinating into the into the intoxicating beverage of raja praong mahawangsa he was left over by the chief of demons the invisibility was then unveiled and consequently he met with the raja praong mahawangsa and converted him to islam the closing period of the text describe the activities of the islamization of kedah until finally sheikh abdullah yamani has to be allowed to return to his home state baghdad the purpose of symbolism in the islamization of the malay world the islamization of the king and the people at large is not seen as only an ordinary transformation It is a meaningful event that needs to be remembered and comprehended in a meaningful way. It is a ritual of purification from the filthy faithful to the purity, from the heretic to the truthful living and it is not merely purification. It is like being reborn. And this is the meaning of ritual purification, combustion and annulling of the sins and faults of the individual and of those of the community as a whole, not a mere purifying regeneration as its name indicates is a new birth misia ilade 2018 apart from being a vehicle for a new birth islamization was also regarded as a victory of the truth over the darkness of religiosity returning from the chaos to the cosmos this momentous event should be described and preserved in the greatest manner and a unique form so it will be re- well remembered and comprehended by the Malays. The three selected texts successfully transmitted to us the story of the Islamization of the Malay kings and people in a form that is unique in its way. That is through dream experience and extraordinary journey. In conclusion, the historical narrative of Islam's arrival and spread in the Malay world has been presented through two distinct approaches by modern scholars and the authors of classical Malay historical texts. Modern historians and post-colonial scholars adopt an empirical and hypothesis-driven approach, focusing on the when, where, or the origin and how of Islam's entry into the region. These scholars often attribute the early arrival of Islam to the 13th century with Indian ports serving as prominent gateways for its introduction propagated by traders along India's coastal areas. Conversely, the classical Malay historical texts take a more mystical and metaphorical path, emphasizing the where and how of Islam's acceptance by the Malay rulers and populace. These texts utilize symbolism and legendary stories to depict the the origin of islam and its embrace of malay rulers and people alike dreams and mysterious journeys are frequently woven into the narratives offering explanation for the rulers conversion to islam followed by the wider populace both approaches shed valuable light on the complex historical event of islam's emergence and pro- proliferation in the malay world while the modern historical perspective provides empirical evidence and tangible data The classical Malay texts offer deeper insights and more meaningful into the spiritual and symbolic dimensions of the transformation. Ultimately, a comprehensive understanding of this historical event may be best achieved by recognizing the merits of both approaches, appreciating the factual basis of modern scholarship and the poetic richness of the classical texts, which together contribute to a more nuanced comprehension of Islam. profound impact on the Malay world's culture and identity.